Welcome back after the break. We'll continue. Uh, we were looking at uh, God's authority structure uh, at the workplace. And now we look at uh, the last authority structure that God has placed in our lives. Uh, God's authority structure for the civil government. Okay. Before we move on to God's authority structure in the civil government, anyone has any questions? Any questions? No? Okay. So let's move on to God's authority structure for the civil government. Okay. Now, uh, we live under two governments. Okay. What are the two governments that uh, believers live under? Any idea? What are the two governments that we live under? Anyone has any idea? Can you mute your mics and share your answer? Or you can even type it. Yes, Lubega. I think just be, like we live in two realms, the spiritual and the natural. So I think we have the, the spiritual government led by God and the natural which we see with our own eyes. Yes, thank you. It's a good answer. Okay, so we live under the government of the kingdom of God. And uh, of course, we since we are also uh, in this world, we are part of the government uh, in our nation, in our state, the place that we live in, Okay, the civil government. And uh, we must understand that God's kingdom authority, just as it is expressed uh, in and through us, through our family, in the local church, in the body of Christ, and the workplace, God's kingdom government also flows, uh, uh, you know, a, 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 through the civil government that is in place in our area that we live in, or the nation, the city that we um, live in. Okay, so we always think that, you know, God's kingdom government just flows uh, in and through our lives, through our lives to others. Uh, through the local church, um, you know, but uh, we were not aware or, you know, that God's uh, kingdom government flows uh, into the workplace uh, to the authority structures that he, that prevail at the workplace. And also God's kingdom government flows into the civil government, the government that um, is there uh, in the nation that we belong to, uh, to the authority structures that, uh, or to the government that God has brought about in our uh, nation, okay? The Bible uh, records a very interesting uh, narrative for us, um, uh, you know, when uh, the Pharisees, they want to trap Jesus, uh, they're finding different ways to trap him. So once they, you know, think about a plan and they want to catch Jesus, they want to trap him. So they come and, you know, first they speak nicely of him. They say, you know, they acknowledge that he's, he's a man who speaks the truth, that he's not afraid of anyone else. He's not afraid of any other man. And then they ask him a question and they said, is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Okay, do you all remember this narrative uh, when, you know, they tried to quiz him, they tried to trap him by asking him a question, is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? What was, uh, um, uh, you know, Jesus' answer? What does Jesus say? Give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar and give to God what belongs to God. Thank you, Lubega. So he's, he asked them to, uh, you know, get a, a coin and uh, he asked them to, uh, you know, he asked them a question. He says, uh, whose image or inscription do you see on this? And they, uh, they say, we see Caesar's. And, he, and what does he tell them? Lubega said, you know, uh, Jesus tells them, give to Caesar or render therefore to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God. That means, you know, uh, uh, pay your taxes to Caesar because... He's in authority, 
And uh, because each one of us are made in the image of God, we need to give ourselves back to God. We need to give God our very uh, selves. Now, they were trying to trap him, uh, you know, uh, if he says, you know, um, uh, uh, you know, should is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar? Then if uh, Jesus answers yes, you know, they could accuse him of being a false Jew who is supporting the Roman government, and they could turn all the other Jews against him. And if he said no, then the Pharisees could accuse Jesus of, uh, uh, you know, uh, kind of leading a revolt against the uh, prevail prevailing Roman government. And, you know, they could have easily handed him off to the Roman soldiers. But we see either way, you no, know, Jesus could not be uh, trapped. But the main point, uh, you know, Jesus is saying is, you know, we need to pay our taxes. Uh, we need to uh, uh, pay our taxes to the government. We need to honor the civil government, regardless of who or what the government uh, was and we do whatever the government requires us to do and we know that um, you know the Jews living under the Roman government they were persecuted they were treated very badly uh, you know they did not enjoy the privileges and hence it was uh, all the more a uh, very very uh, you know uh, the right time for uh, for them to look for a messiah and for the right time for god the kairos moment for god to send the messiah because of what uh, the jews were uh, going through okay so we see that you know uh, jesus himself is saying that we need to pay our tax to the government we need to honor the civil government irrespective of who they are what they do uh, and we need to follow whatever the government requires us to do. And Paul ex explains this for us in Romans chapter 13, verses 1 to verse 7. But uh, we will look at um, uh, verses 2 to 7 in a little bit. But we'll just look at Romans chapter 13, verse 1. So can somebody please read Romans chapter 13, verse 1, please, for us? Romans 13, 1. Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Thank you, Zelatoli. So here see, we, uh, we read that as believers, we must learn to um, look at government authorities as those who are appointed by God. Okay, so we need to look at them as though they are appointed by God. But we can ask these questions. What if, you know, the government is abusive? What if they are wasting our hard-earned money, the taxes that we are paying? Uh, what if they're making wrong decisions? And what if they're doing all the wrong things? Then, you know, what do we do? Uh, even in those situations, you know, it's our responsibility to obey, respect, and honor the government because the government is appointed by God. That's what God's word says. And what they are doing, you know, wasting the money, doing making wrong decisions, they're being abusive. Well, that's not our responsibility. They are, you know, will be held accountable to God. But we need to follow uh, and do what is our God-given responsibility that we need to obey, respect, and honor the government that God has appointed uh, uh, here in, in in our city or in our nation. And God in his own way is will be able to work in the government. He is able to release his influence in and through our governing, government and change things, you know, uh, uh, even as we pray, even as we ask him uh, to move on our behalf. And then Paul continues in the same chapter in Romans chapter 13, verses 2 to 7. So can somebody please read verses 2 to 7 of Romans chapter 13, please? Romans chapter 13, verse 2 to 7. Consequently, he who rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted. And those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers hold no terror for those who do right, but for those who do wrong. Do you want to be free from fear of the one in authority? Then do what is right, and he will commend you. For he is God's servant to do you good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword for nothing. He is God's servant, an angel of wrath, 
an agent of wrath to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. Therefore, it is necessary to submit to the authorities not only because of possible punishment, but also because of conscience. This is also why you pay taxes for the authorities or God's servants who give their full time to governing. Give everyone what you owe him. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honor, then honor. Thank you, Jafina. So how is uh, Paul addressing those in government positions? What is he calling them? What is he calling them? God's servant. God's servants, yes. Uh, uh, and also in other versions, it says God's ministers. So those in civil government, uh, you know, Paul is referring to them as God's ministers you know and I, i'm sure it's not out of his own wisdom or knowledge but we know all scripture is all scriptures inspired by god and uh, you know that's how god looks at them as well you know he's referring to them as god's uh, ministers okay god calls them as god's ministers so paul was writing to believers who are living under uh, the Roman government, like I said, and many of those rulers and leaders were, uh, you know, idolatrous. They were very oppressive. Uh, they were just killing people, uh, very bloody in their son. Uh, the rule was very, uh, you know, was a, a tyrannical rule. Uh, it was a tyranny for them, and people were finding it very, very difficult. Uh, and yet, you know, Paul is uh, calling believers to see God's kingdom uh, government being administered to them through the civil government that they were under. And I'm sure it would have been very uh, difficult for the Romans to see this perspective because, you know, um, they were persecuted. They were also sent away from Rome. All the all the Jews, all the Christians were sent away from Rome, and uh, you know there was many of them were martyred, persecuted. It was very difficult. But in that situation, Paul, uh, you know, is saying, telling the believers to see God's kingdom government being administered to them through the civil government that they are under. Okay. So Rosalind has a question here. Can a pastor collect offerings and tithes in cash and not give church bank account details to avoid paying taxes? Is it wrong or right? I think that is wrong. Uh, we need to, uh, you know, maintain honesty and integrity in the accounting, even in uh, church, uh, you know, uh, and we need to, have an open book so that you know when people or the income tax department checks us you know they will not find uh, uh, anything amiss or you know they will not see dishonesty um, and you know pull us out for that and that's not being uh, a good representative of who Christ is I think what we need to do is we need to keep uh, Every money, even one rupee that comes in, keep it into, uh, uh, keep it in account, uh, you know, keep it open, uh, have it, uh, you know, uh, shown to all the members because at APC we do that. Uh, we have an accountant, we have a chartered accountant, uh, all of our staff, you know, who come under the tax bracket, uh, our taxes are cut. Uh, and uh, we have somebody who's doing our uh, uh, income tax and you know our taxing we also cut taxes from you know vendors that we we purchase things from and everything is an open book so anytime the income tax department i'm sure they have already been uh, you know seeing all our uh, accounting they know that our accounting is up to mark uh, you know uh, and there is no nothing wrong so they can't pull us out or pull us up anytime and at one point of time even the income tax uh, director of Bangalore city was uh, you know knew that apc was a church that had everything in account and was clear and clean and uh, you know he also had pastor ashish's books on his table uh, and he says you know i'm reading your books so that is a kind of uh, i think uh, uh, honesty and integrity that we need to show even in the world uh, and be open and do what is uh, open about our accounts and do what is right. And even all our church members at the end of the year, they can go and they can see, 
you know, how the tithes, the offerings, everything has been used by the church and anyone can raise up questions. Why it was so much used for what? And, you know, so everything is very open. And I think that's very important. We're accountable to God and accountable to man as well. And so we need to have everything right. Okay, we'll continue. So, um, uh, regard, uh, thank you, Rosalind, for the question. Uh, we'll continue. Regardless of what kind of government or what form of government system who is in power, what rules they have made, uh, what abuses that are carried out as believers, the Word of God tells us, Scripture tells us that we are to respect, give honor to those who are in government authority over us. Uh, you know, we can't say I don't like them. Uh, they are not the party that uh, uh, I like. They are not the party that I wanted. They are not the party that I, you know, I voted for them. Uh, well, none of that stands. Uh, if they are somebody from a party that you don't uh, uh, agree to support, you do not vote for them, but they've come into power, you have to give them respect, give them the honor, uh, uh, you know, and also do uh, what they require of us. Um, and also we need to pay our uh, taxes, okay? So when we rightly relate to them, uh, or rightly relate to the civil government, the, the, the authority structure that God is bringing about to the government, you know, when we honor them, uh, we respect them, we submit to them, we follow the rules and the law, uh, then, you know, uh, when you do that, you receive God's government into your own life and God will honor you. You, you position yourself for God's blessing, okay? Um, now, since we're living under two governments, the government of the kingdom of God and the government of uh, uh, the land that we uh, are residing in, the nation that we are in, there can be times when or situations when the government of the land will contradict God's government. You know, when the government of the land will tell us to do certain things that is against God's government, his rule, his ordinances, his law, his commandments. So what do we do at those times? What do we do at those times? When the government of the land, the civil government is, uh, you know, asking us to do things that are not according to God's government order, kingdom government, what he has asked us to do, rules and regulations, the laws that he has laid, us, laid down, what do we do at that time? Any responses? What do we do? Um, we won't. Uh, we won't do anything against the word of God for sure. So we'll just keep on prayers. Maybe like a Shatrak Mishakanabhitriko. In that time, they were asked to worship the king, but they didn't do it. And for sure, when we obey God, God will make changes. So no matter what, our first priority is word and God. So yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Jepita. Um, uh, a good response. So, you know, at that time, you know, we have the full freedom to violate, you know, or, uh, uh, you know, we have the full freedom at that time to uh, disobey. Uh, to break, to go against uh, the government of the land and submit to God's government. Uh, and we know we will face persecution. Uh, but, you know, as Jafina said, uh, you know, like Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, God is there to rescue or help. Or even if he doesn't rescue, we are to do what honors God, what he has asked us to do. Okay. Anyone has any Think to discuss on that. Any differing views on that? You might be thinking, is this biblical or not? So let's look at an example in Acts chapter four, verse nineteen. We also uh, heard Jeffina's, uh, you know, give us an example of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. In Acts chapter four, we read, uh, you know, Peter and John, uh, you know, were standing before the high priest, and they were instructed not to preach and teach in the name of. Uh, Jesus. And what do Peter and uh, John reply? You know, Acts chapter 4, verse 19. Can somebody read that? Acts chapter 4, verse 19, please. Acts chapter 4, verse 19. But John, but Peter and John replied, Judge for yourself whether it is right in God's sight to obey you rather than God. Yeah, so they, you know, um, 
they don't give a uh, you know direct answer but they said you judge whether it's right for us to obey god or to obey man okay and later we read in uh, you know acts chapter 5 verse 20 29 this whole thing continues you now when peter and john later were brought before the council uh, once again and they were questioned about their violation you know we let you go and we asked you not to preach and teach the name of jesus and you know uh, why are you doing that then again you know what do they reply in acts chapter 5 verse 29 was what does peter and john reply acts 5 29 acts 5 29 but peter and the other apostles answered and said we ought to obey god rather than men <laughs> thank you Rosalind. so here we see that you know when uh, we are faced with situations uh you know uh when it comes to the you know l submitting to uh rules of the government of the land when they're asking us to things that are against god's kingdom government then we need to take a stand we submit to god's kingdom government and not you know we can uh, we have the freedom to violate or disobey uh, the government of the land okay so we see here that the kingdom of god in the kingdom of god the government is very different of this world we already know that okay now uh, we can ask a question uh, which form of government is right is democracy or monarchy the right kind of uh, government okay and so you know some of us can say that you know i will follow the monarchy because uh, god is king and uh, you know from the bible we see that he's a king i learned from uh, the kingdom of god that god is king and uh, and we also have uh, two books in the bible first kings and second kings and there is no democracy in the bible and hence i will not follow democracy but if there is a monarchy i will follow okay uh, now we need to know that the kingdom of god is theocracy okay theo is god theocracy so in the kingdom of god which is theocracy you know it is god who is uh, in 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 control in dominion who's uh, uh, who's the ruler and uh, when he speaks when he asks us to do something no one asks any questions okay uh, we just have to follow what he says or we just do what he says and also in God's government uh, because it's theocracy no one gets to vote no one gets to vote whether God what God said is right or wrong whether we should do it or not do it um, or we should be doing something else uh, we have we have no right to vote no one gets the right to vote no one asks any questions you know uh, we just follow his order so when God told Joshua, for example, just one of the many examples, when God told Joshua um, to get all of the Israelites to march around the walls of Jericho once each day for seven days, and seven times around the wall of Jericho on the seventh day, um, and he gave this as a military strategy to conquer the city, you know, no one got to vote. The people didn't get to vote whether uh, well, this was the right approach or not. But God has spoken, God had told Joshua this, and he told the people, and everyone just had to obey, okay? So also, you know, uh, in our day, uh, when we receive clear instructions, directives from God, we follow uh, regardless of whether we, we think it's right or wrong, according to our logical reasoning, it might not fit. Uh, this is not what we had envisioned. This is not what we have thought. Uh, this is not something that's a popular opinion. This is what, not what the community uh, or our, our family would prefer. Uh, but, you know, um, uh, this does place a great responsibility on us, and we need to just do what God is asking us to uh, do also it's a place of responsibility of those in leadership uh, to you know ensure that they hear correctly from God uh, receive the correct directives and communicate that accurately to his people so as leaders pastors apostles prophets missionaries you know uh, all of them have to be very uh, uh, you know, they have a great responsibility to hear correctly from God, just like Joshua had to hear correctly, Moses had to hear correctly, Samuel, and so many others as well. They had to hear correctly from God, his directives, and communicate that accurately to the people. Um, 
and you know we see that uh, it was followed by people in the biblical times and this is the kind of leadership that uh, we also require in our present day situation in our time in the local church in the family in the body of christ and this is so important for us so as leaders you know some of you are leaders we need we have this great responsibility to hear correctly from god and communicate to people what god wants us to uh, do okay so many of us uh, you know are uh, in our the nations that we're living in we're living under a democratic system uh, you know uh, and it's, uh, you know, we need to bring our democratic mindsets in doing things for the kingdom of God. Um, uh, and God says, you know, whatever God says, we need, we need to follow it. So in the kingdom of God, you know, the regardless of what government we have, uh, we need to understand a few things. The first thing is that God is able to work in spite of who is in authority. Okay. In spite of whoever is in authority, God is able to work, God is able to bring about uh, 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 his purposes or he's able to accomplish his purposes. And we see this uh, in, uh, in time and history and even in the Bible. You know, uh, Pharaoh, who was uh, the uh, ruling over Egypt, and uh, he was so hard-hearted. But in spite of that, he was not allowing the people to go, let the people go out of Egypt, the, the Hebrews, the Israelites. But, you know, God still accomplished his purposes. Uh, he allowed, you know, uh, uh, he got Pharaoh to allow them to, the people of uh, uh, Israel, the Hebrews living in Egypt, uh, to go. So we also see this in many other cases as well in the Bible. So the first thing is when God is able to work in spite of those who are in authority. He's able to bring about his uh, purposes. He's able to accomplish his purposes. The second thing that we can understand is, uh, you know, as people in a nation who are under a government, we have a responsibility to uh, whatever extent our rights allow us or permits us to vote or to pray for the right people in authority. Okay, so every nation receives a government it deserves. Okay, and we must remember that a nation always receives the government it deserves. So if a nation is filled with people who are corrupt, who have no regard for moral values, then they will have a leader who does the same because they're from the same culture. Uh, you know, because uh, after all, these leaders grew up among the people who have the same culture. Uh, but, you know, however, if the people change, then the government will also change. And the government, therefore, you know, we know is an expression of the people it represents. So if the people in the country are corrupt, we'll have a corrupt uh, leader, uh, corrupt leaders. If we have people who are immoral uh, in our nation, we'll have uh, immoral leaders because they're growing up in the same culture. So the government is an expression of the people it uh, resembles or represents. Okay, The government we have today uh, is what we deserve you know, uh, and whatever we pray for, or, you know, or not, or even if we don't pray for, we vote for them, or we don't vote for them, you know, uh, we got what we deserve, we got the fruits of our own efforts, okay, because that is, the you know, what people are investing in, they're investing in things of God, we'll have a godly leader, uh, if you have a culture where there's honesty and integrity, we'll have a leader who's honest and, you know, a man of integrity or a woman of integrity. So we must invest time and effort and pray, you know, um, that our nation uh, will, you know, people in our nation will have the right attitudes, the right mindsets, the right culture, the right values, the right moral values, so that, you know, our government and those in leadership can also have the same culture because they are one among the uh, people. Okay, Proverbs chapter 29 verse 2 says, can somebody read Proverbs chapter 29 verse 2 please? Proverbs 29 2. Proverbs 29 3 ma'am. 2. Chapter verse 2. Sorry. Proverbs 29 verse Verse 2, when the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. But when a wicked man rules, the people groan. 
Thank you. So here we see when the righteous are in authority, the people are benefited, they are happy. But when a wicked man rules, the people groan. So we have the authority to bring the right government. Okay. Uh, uh, and how do we have the, uh, how do we exercise our right? We pray. Okay, we pray and ask God, uh, you know, to bring the right government. We also vote for the right government. We also speak to people uh, in our church and tell them, you know, to exercise their authority to vote, to vote for the right government. We also tell them, you know, uh, uh, to exercise their authority to pray that the right government will come into uh, uh, into uh, leadership. Okay, but. Sometimes irrespective of the government, you know, we need to, uh, whichever government comes into place, we know that God is able to bring about his influence and still achieve his purposes that he wants to uh, bring about at that time in that, uh, you know, that season. Okay. Uh, we read in John chapter 19 verses 10 and 11 when Jesus was brought before Pilate, uh, you know, just uh, during his trial, just before his crucifixion. And Pilate said to him, do you not know that I have the authority to crucify you and the power to release you? Uh, I'm sure this is very familiar. You've read this before. And what does Jesus answer? He says, you could have no power at all against me unless it has been given to you from above. Therefore, the one who delivered me to you has the greater sin. So here we see that, you know, Jesus acknowledged that Pilate was in a position uh, because God allowed it to be so, because it was God who allowed him to be in that position. And so Jesus says, I respect that. And hence he wasn't speaking anything that was demeaning to Pilate or he was not disrespecting him in any way. Um, and he says, regardless of what Pilate's decision was going to be, Jesus recognized that there would be no sin on Pilate's part. Why was why would there be no sin on Pilate's part? Because he had to make the decision either way, you know, because of his position. And, uh, you know, but however, those who delivered Jesus to Pilate, that is Judas, Judas and the high priest and the Sanhedrin, uh, they were you know, uh, 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 the ones who had the greatest sin because it was them, or it was they who gave uh, Jesus up uh, to be tried and for crucifixion, okay? So the amazing thing here is about Jesus' acknowledgement of Pilate's position as one who has been given it from above or somebody, uh, or uh, he was in that position because God allowed him to be in that uh, position and hence we see that you know Jesus does not dishonor him or devalue who Pilate was or the position he held in the Roman government uh, structure. So we know that uh, you know from all of these examples that it's people in leadership and position are there because God has allowed them to be in that position. Okay, so a lesson for us here is to recognize that those in governmental authority have been allowed by God to be there. So, you know, we have to pray for those in authority and leadership. Uh, when we have the time, let's pray for the right kind of people. That is when your elections are taking place. That's the right time, you know, before the elections take place. We pray for the right righteous people to come into position. And then we also use our authority or the rights that we have in the land to vote uh, to bring the right people in the government, okay? Uh, we must also acknowledge uh, what Proverbs teaches us in Proverbs chapter 21, verse 1. The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. Like the rivers of water, he turns it wherever he wishes, okay? Which means the heart of the ruler, the heart of the king, the heart of the government, the heart of the leader is in whose hands? It's in the hands of God. Okay. So regardless of who he is, what he does, what his position is, God can influence and supernaturally affect changes in the heart of the leader. An example that uh, one or two examples that we can look at is uh, Pharaoh. You know, uh, Pharaoh tells, um, uh, sorry, God tells Moses that Pharaoh is very hard hearted. He will not easily let the people go. But God says, I will demonstrate uh, to him my power. You know, I will perform miracles and he will see my uh, power. And, you know, ultimately he will let the people 
go. Okay, so we see that, you know, uh, even as Pharaoh's heart was hardened and God does all of, sends all of these plagues, you know, the t 10 plagues, you know, uh, he is he, demonstrating more and more miracles so that the people, you know, the Hebrew people, the, the Israelites will be absolutely convinced that, you know, they must follow this God who is doing all these amazing miracles. Why? Because, you know, they had, no, they had, they had never seen God move for 400 years. They were slaves. They were crying out to God. They only know God as God as the, you know, father of uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They had no special relationship with him. Uh, and so, you know, uh, these miracles was, was one way they could absolutely be convinced that it was the God of their forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who was doing all this for them, doing all these amazing miracles. He's the one who's delivering them, uh, you know, taking them out of bondage or the slavery to freedom. Uh, and that is why, you know, when people experienced this and then God told them, you know, to leave Egypt, they immediately obeyed. They packed all their things and they left that very night, that single night, you know, they just left. No questions asked. Uh, why? Because they had already seen God's awesome power at work. They had seen the awesome power of their God. Another example we can look at is Nehemiah. You know, uh, we know that Nehemiah was stirred up in his heart when he heard that the walls of Jerusalem had been broken down. He was actually the cupbearer to the Persian king, uh, King Artaxerxes. And, uh, uh, you know, who was an unsaved man who was, uh, we, uh, we call them heathens, okay? And uh, we see that this uh, king, who was uh, not even a Jew, who was not even from Jerusalem, he was a Persian king, unsaved, uh, he not only gives Nehemiah permission, you know, to go, but he also gives him a paid vacation, okay, to go and get the job done. He also has, uh, you know, gives him letters to have the materials, uh, to build the wall, and he sends an escort, he sends, uh, you know, uh, uh, soldiers to ensure his safety, even as he traveled from Persia to Jerusalem. And so here we see, you know, this, this heathen king was willing to do all this, uh, 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 was willing to do everything that was in the heart of Nehemiah, and hence Nehemiah was able to accomplish the task, of course, with God's help, uh, he was able to do it, but also God used this uh, this unsaved uh, Persian king, King of Artaxerxes. We also see that God works through King Cyrus, who was again a Persian king. Uh, you know, uh, God worked in his heart to send the Jews back uh, from captivity uh, to Jerusalem. So he says, okay, you people go back, go back to your own land, be happy there. So we see that God works through leaders to, uh, who come to power to fulfill his purposes. Um, and, you know, we just need to have this confidence that, you know, we have uh, God as our king and he is able to move. He is able to change the hearts of kings and rulers and those in authority. He's able to affect them and to make the um, changes. Okay. So, um, and we need, hence, we need to take all of these principles that we are learning here, you know, and apply it to every other authority structure that God has placed in our life, that you and I place in our life, face in our life, whether it is the family, the local church, the body of Christ, or the workplace. So, regardless of who or what kind of people uh, uh, they are in leadership position, we relate them rightly. Uh, and when we relate to them rightly, we will receive God's working in our life uh, because God is able to do it. Our responsibility is to give honor to whom honor is due. Our responsibility is to acknowledge that God has allowed them to be in that position or rank uh, for, you know, whatever reason. Uh, uh, like Jesus standing before Pilate, uh, he knew it was because God has allowed it uh, uh, to happen. And, uh, you know, he has brought Pilate into that position. And whatever decisions he makes is not his fault, but someone else is responsible for this. And so you also recognize and acknowledge that God is there. He's the one who is bringing, uh, you know, uh, the government into position, into leadership. And also we need to recognize that God's government comes into our life through the authority structures 
that you and I are part of. And if we relate rightly, we will receive his kingdom coming into our life. And we will also see his kingdom government increase. Okay. Uh, now, some of us can be in leadership positions or in places of authority in God's structure. For example, you know, you're a husband, the leader of the home, uh, and hence you are part of God's government at home. And if God's government uh, at home is, you know, to you want to see an increase in your home, uh, then it uh, you want to see God's blessing flowing through your home, then it comes through the husband. Okay, you are that important link in that chain and God's blessing, God's government is assured into the family through the husband. And if the husband fails, then, you know, uh, it can have serious consequences in your home. Now, likewise, uh, a wife, you know, you have also your responsibility. You are also linked in that chain and through which God's government is coming as a wife, you know, and uh, as children, we also have, uh, our responsibility in God's uh, government structure at home. And if we fail, you know, to fulfill our responsibilities rightly, you know, there can be serious consequences at home. Okay. Uh, for example, just imagine, you know, if the civil government, if the government in our nation fails, what happens to our nation or state? You know, the same thing happens at home. You know, if you as the head of the home, the husband is the head of the home, fails in your responsibility, then there will be chaos in the home. Why will there be chaos? Because God's government is not able to come into your home through the leadership position that he has uh, appointed, that is through the husband. Okay. The same thing, rule applies in the workplace, the local church, the body of Christ. Some of us are leader, uh, place of leadership or responsibility in the workplace, in the body of Christ, on the, in the local church. And, uh, you know, we need to recognize that God's uh, government is coming in and through us, through that leadership position. So we have to take things seriously. Um, if we do well, if we do things that are right, uh, then, you know, people under us will rejoice. And uh, if, you, if we do the right thing, then people under us will be blessed uh, and they would want to follow the government of God. But if we as leaders are abusive, you know, then people will suffer. So it all depends on us how we are, uh, you know, able to uh, relate to God's government uh, uh, structure that he has placed. You know, we need to recognize it. We need to understand it. Uh, you know, uh, we need to learn and understand how God's government is flowing through his authority structures. We need to learn to relate to it correctly. Uh, so that we can position ourselves to receive God's blessing that he is intended through it. Okay, that is uh, the end of God's um, uh, kingdom government. Okay, anyone has any questions? Any questions? No questions? Okay, if there are no questions, then uh, we just end class. I know we are ending about uh, seven minutes early, but we just want to start another new chapter. We'll begin a new chapter next week. Unless there are any questions anyone has. Okay, no questions. Then we'll end class. Thank you all for uh, joining class today. And um, have a blessed week. And I'll see you uh, uh, next Wednesday. And hope all of you have submitted your uh, assessment, your first assessment. Uh, the due date was uh, yesterday evening. OK. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor.